Okay, I'm going to go quickly through the last three sections in section 6.2. There are three different bounds discussed. Uh, the, the first one is a slight variation of the Markov and Chebyshev bounds that we've seen. The second one is Cauchy-Schwartz, which you've seen before in different contexts when you talk about links of vectors. And the last one is called Jensen's inequality, which is fairly straightforward to understand. Now, in this chapter, most of the exercises is how I'm applying these inequalities. So, uh, you just need to know how to use the equations. And for that, you can simply read the examples in the textbook and follow along with those. All right. So, the Chernoff bound is really a takeoff on the Markov inequality. Uh, simply, you use the fact that the exponential is a monotonic function of its argument. It's either, uh, de it's either increasing if the coefficient is positive, or it's decreasing if the coefficient is negative. All right, so take a look at these two equations here. Probability that x is greater than or equal to a is equal to the probability that e to the sx is greater than or equal to e to the sa. Okay, so let me illustrate that. So I will take these and grab them. All right, now, why is the first one true? Well, let's draw a picture of this function, e to the e to the s, okay, e to the s times x, okay? So if this is x, then e to the s times x is going to be Positive is going to look like this if s is greater than zero. Okay. Of course, if s is equal to zero, it's just flat. But if s is less than zero, okay. okay. So, if, for instance, if I take the value a here. Right? If I take the value a here, then this value here is going to be e to the s times a. So if my value of x is bigger than a, then my value of e to the sx is going to be bigger than e to the sa. So that's exactly what we're saying here. If the random variable x is bigger than a, then e to the s times that value of that random variable will be bigger than e to the sa. Okay. And that comes from the fact that e to the sx is increasing if s is greater than zero. So that's the case when s is greater than zero. On the other hand, when s is less than zero, look at this function. The values of s become larger, I'm sorry, the values of e to the sx become larger as x gets smaller. Okay. So the probability that x is less than or equal to a is over here to the left of a. So x is less than or equal to a means that e to the sx is greater than or equal to e to the sa when s is less than or equal to zero. Right? Because when x is over here to the left of a, e to the sx is larger than the value at this, at this point it's because it's increasing to the left. Okay? So both of these are true. Now, how can we use this to get probability bounds? Well, let's go back to the chapter and see. All right. Now, from this here, we can use Markov's inequality because e to the sx is a random variable and e to the sa is a value. Okay. So, if you remember the probability uh, from the Markov inequality, the probability that a random variable is bigger than or equal to the value is uh, less than or equal to the expected value of the random variable divided by the value. Okay. The advantage of this is that this is true no matter what s is. So I can choose the best possible value of s to get me the smallest possible bound on the probability that x is greater than or equal to a. All right, so this inequality came from the first inequality up here. Similarly, when s is less than zero, I can use the second inequality. The probability that x is less than or equal to a is less than or equal to this expectation of e to the sx divided by e to the sa.
And that's going to be true for any negative value of s. So I can choose the value of s that gives me the very best bound. All right, so we get these equations here. So at this point, you just need to apply these equations. And I'll leave you to read this example, which is very clear. You need to know how to plug in the different terms into these inequalities. And he compares the three inequalities for one particular case. And it turns out that this most recent Chernoff bound actually gives a stronger bound than the other two bounds. All right, so that's uh, what I'm going to say about Chernoff. So the idea is that you have these equations, you need to apply them, and it should be a straightforward substitution to apply these bounds. Let's go to the next bound. Next bound is Cauchy-Schwarz. Now you probably have seen Cauchy-Schwarz in a different context. So let me remind you of the previous context and show you how that gives me the same thing as what we have here. So let's draw a line and we'll move on to Cauchy-Schwarz. Let's get rid of the red pen and do another color here. I don't know why I've gotten stuck in red, but let's do something else. So Cauchy-Schwarz. So this is, we have Cauchy-Schwarz for expectation values here. Okay, so recall Cauchy-Schwarz for vectors. Okay, and let me remind you of that. I can just draw it in two dimensions. If I have one vector, x, and another vector, y, and they have some angle between them, then the Cauchy-Schwarz says that the cosine of the angle well, the cosine of the angle is less than or equal to 1. I certainly know that, okay. But the cosine of the angle is given by uh, x dot y divided by the length of x times the length of y. Okay. So you may have seen Cauchy-Schwartz in this form, that the uh, x y and these, this denotes the norm or length of the vector times cos theta equals x dot y. And what that means is if I take the cosine off here, that means that the length of x times the length of y is greater than or equal to x dot y. Okay. Now in two dimensions, this is equal to x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus, and if I go to n dimensions, I'll go to x, n, y, n. Okay. So in n dimensions, that was what this is. So this is n dimensions. Now, what is the length of, of x? Length of x is going to be the square root of x1 squared plus dot, 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 plus x, n squared. The length of y is the square root of y1 squared plus y, n squared. Okay. So I can write this in, this in this general way, is that the square root of x1 squared times the square root of y1 squared, yn squared. That's going to be uh, greater than or equal to x1, y1, plus, plus xn, yn. Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit of a wrinkle here. I'm going to add P1s here. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to add probabilities here. Okay, so I'm going to change this to, uh, uh, instead of writing x1, so let, here, let me just say it this way. So I'm going to apply this, this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. To the vectors. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. I'm, instead of just taking x1 and y1, I'm going to take square root of p1, x1, and square root of pn, xn. So that's my first vector. And then my second vector is going to be square root of p1, y1, square root of pn, yn. 
Okay. So what is that going to give me? So I'll plug this into Cauchy-Schwarz. Now, since I'm applying this to these vectors, I'm going to replace x1 here with square root of p1x1, right? That's what you do when you do substitution. Okay. So I'm applying the same rule, but now with a different vector. Okay. So on the right-hand side here, I'm going to have square root of p1x1 times square root of p1y1, and then plus all the way to square root of pn xn times the square root of pn yn. Okay. Now what do I have over here? Well, I've got the square root, and then here I have square root of p1 x1 squared, plus, and this goes up to square root of pn uh, uh, xn squared. And I'm multiplying that by the square root of p1 uh, times y1. Now the y1 is not under the square root, right? And this is going to be square root of pn yn squared. All right, so let's simplify now. Notice that all the square roots of pn come in squares. So this actually becomes the square root of p1 x1 squared pn xn squared. This one becomes the square root of p1 y1 squared pn yn squared. And this is greater than or equal to and the square root of p1 here combines with the square root of p1 here, if you see those two. That's p1 x1 y1 plus pn xn yn. Right. So let's apply this probabilistically. Suppose I have x and y as jointly distributed random variables. Okay, so suppose, give me back my pen. Suppose, uh, suppose x and y are jointly distributed random variables, and the probability that x equals x1, x, xj, uh, and y equals yj, as equal to pj uh, for j is equal to 1 up to n. Okay. Now that means that the expectation of xy, what's the formula there? Well, remember the formula that's equal to the sum over the possible va pairs of values. So this is going to be, uh, I have n possible pairs of values. So this would be j equals 1 to n of pj x, j, y, j. Okay. And that's simply equal to the right-hand side here, right? That's equal to p1, x1, y1, plus dot, 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 p, n, x, n, y, n. Okay. How about the left-hand side? Well, what's the expectation of this square? Well, that's simply going to be the sum j equals 1 to n of p, j, x, j squared. And that's simply equal to p, 1 x1 squared plus dot 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 plus p n x n squared. And then we also have expectation of y squared similarly is equal to p1 y1 squared plus p n y n squared. Okay. So what does this give us all together? We have okay. on the left hand side we have the square root of the expectation of x squared times the square root of the expectation of y squared. And on the right-hand side, we have expectation of xy. So we have the square root of expectation of x squared times the expectation of y squared. I put those two over one square root. It's the same thing. Okay. And that's going to be e is greater than or equal to the expectation of xy. Okay. So I've shown this for discrete random variables. It turns out the same thing is true for continuous random variables. Okay. All right. So that's a convenient inequality. And again, you will be applying that in the homework problems, but this is the idea of where it comes from. Now this proof here, this is a general proof that you may also have seen for the regular Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. 
Uh, you can read that. It's a calculus proof, um, but uh, it's fine. All right. Now, using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, you can show that the correlation coefficient is always less than or equal to 1. Uh, it's just a rearrangement of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. All right, so we can move on to the next section. The last section is Jensen's inequality. And this also is a, quite an easy idea. We go directly to the picture here and see what's going on. Here we have a convex function. Here we have a concave function. Let's focus on the convex function. Now, see what the convex function has a property. So you may know that this has a positive second derivative, but we're not so concerned with the second derivative right now. What we're concerned about is the properties of the secant lines. Secant line is a line that joins two points on the curve. So notice when the function is convex, the curve lies below the secant line. Now, it's true that the curve will be convex if the second derivative is greater than zero, but the important property and the mathematical definition of convex is that the curve lies below the secant line. Now, the points on the secant line uh, are, if I have a, so let me go ahead and grab this and put it on my OneNote. Okay. And we'll take that and we'll grab it screen clipping, and take this one. So I'm just interested in convex right now. And I'll probably want to blow it up a little bit. Sorry. Okay. Let's take some point between x and y. I can do this. All right. Now, this point here between x and y is really some combination of x and y. I can write this as some number alpha times x plus 1 minus alpha times y. Okay. Another way to see that, this is going to be equal to uh, y plus alpha times x minus y, where alpha is between 0 and 1. Right, if I start at y and I take alpha times x minus y, as alpha gets bigger, I'm going to get go negative because in this case x is less than y. So I'm going to go down, 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 down. When alpha equals 1, I actually reach x. So any point between x and y can be expressed here uh, this way as a combination of x and y when we have uh, the alphas between 0 and 1. Okay? Now here, this is g, this is, uh, g of x here. And then this is g of y here. Okay. Now, what about the point here? Well, the point is that the ratio of these lengths is the same thing as the ratio of these lengths. Okay. So, if I want to take the tangent line, corresponding to alpha times x plus 1 minus alpha times y. Uh, the point on the tangent line is going to be alpha times g of x plus 1 minus alpha times g of y. Okay? So this point here on the tangent line is equal to alpha times g of x plus 1 minus alpha times g of y. Same linear combination as this one here. Now, what about this point here? This is, uh, sorry, this is the point y equals g of x. Now, this point here is g at the point alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y. Okay, it's g evaluated at this point. So, notice the relationship between these two. The point on the, on the secant line is above the point of the function. Okay, so for convex function, We have alpha g of x plus 1 minus alpha times g of y is always above g of, well, here I'll have to write on the second line, sorry. It's not erasing for me. 
there we go. Okay, so it's greater than or equal to g of alpha x plus 1 minus alpha times y. Okay, so that's my basic inequality uh, for two points. Now it turns out that I can do the same thing for endpoints. You can see that in some respect, this point here is a weighted average of x and y. Right? The coefficients add up to 1. And I'm taking a linear combination of these two, positive linear combination, where the coefficients add up to 1. So for endpoints, we can generalize. OK, let's take alpha 1 up to alpha n where alpha j is greater than 0 uh, for j equals 1 to n, and the sum alpha 1 up to alpha n is equal to 1. So the sum of all the alpha j's is equal to 1. Okay. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to consider what about g of alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 plus alpha n xn. So this is a linear combination, positive linear combination of x1 through xn. So this term here that I just wrote here, this is analogous to this term here. So uh, for a convex function that's less than or equal to alpha 1 times g of x1 plus alpha n g of xn. Now of course I can write that as the sum from j equals 1 to n of alpha j g of xj. Okay, and that's the inequality that he has here. So, uh, all right, so he did it for, for 2, and then you can use induction or some other method to show that this is going to be true in general. So this is what I just wrote down. Okay, so the question now is also you want to apply this. Uh, to random variables. So how does this work with random variables? Well, think about what the alphas were. I said that the alphas were greater than 0, and the alphas sum to 1. What does that remind you of? Well, it's like probabilities. Okay. So I have a probability distribution where the probability of xi is equal to pi. I'm, I'm sorry, probability of xi is equal to alpha i then this sum here is just going to be the expected value of that random variable. Right? Right. Exactly what he's saying here. If alpha i is the probability that x equals xi, then here I have the sum of values times probabilities. Okay. So that simply means that what I have here is the expected value of this random variable x that takes these n possible values. Now what do I have over here? Well, I have probabilities, and now it's times g of x. So what I've done is I've taken g of my random variable x. Right. So the right-hand side becomes the expected value of g of x. Okay. So I do have this inequality. g of the expected value is less than or equal to the expected value of g of x. And that only, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Less than or equal to expected value of g of x. So he wrote it backwards here, but that's the same thing. Right? The right hand, the left hand side here is the right hand side here, and vice versa. Right? Now, of course, you have to remember that this is only true if g of x is a convex function. Okay. And as he says, a useful method for uh, determining um, whether a function is convex is look at the second derivative. Okay. And then down here, it's simply applying this to different functions of random variables. So I'll let you look at this. And I recommend you look at some of the uh, solved problems to see how this applies. All right? So that's where the inequality comes from. And the problems will require you to apply this inequality. OK, that's it.